Okay, everybody, this is Dr. Grenye. I am trying to redo my lymphatics and immunity um, lectures for Bio 208, and this is fall 2017. So I am going to spend the next 40 minutes trying to get through some of the material here so that those of you that have the problems in accessing the old videos where it breaks off or gives you issue. Um, hopefully I'll be able to get through the material and cover everything you need to know that was maybe skipped, lost, or damaged in those recordings. All right, so again, we're using the Martini, Nath, and Bartholomew books, um, Fundamentals of Anatomy and Physiology. The new book is purple, so as long as you have one of these books, the content should work for this class. So we just finished cardiovascular, and in chapter 21, we talked about uh, filtration and absorption at the capillary level and the net filtration pressure and how we lose fluid from our blood plasma to the extracellular areas around cells known as the interstitial fluid. And so what ends up happening is part of what we're doing with this lymphatic system is we are going to have to return that fluid to our cardiovascular system. And as we return that fluid back to the cardiovascular system, we're going to move it through a series of vessels that are going to pass through these large cell populated areas that contain lots of the immune cells. And the immune cells of interest for the system, of course, are the B cells and the T cells cells, which are lymphocytes. So part of the reason why it gets the name lymphatics is because this system is going to be very heavily dependent on what the lymphocytes exist to do, and that is immune function. All right. So this system, of course, is the cells, the tissues, and the organs that are responsible for defending our body against environmental and internal threats that are trying to maybe move locations. Uh, most of the defenses are our first tier and first line of defenses are are going to be associated with other organ systems and then come together with this system as we look at the specific nature of lymphocytes and how they work. Okay, so when we look at again the immune system, it falls under here because lymphocytes and then many of the parts of the non specific immune defenses are going to include the immune cells and how they work together again to overcome a pathogen. All right, and a pathogen is kind of an all encompassing term that we can refer to any bacteria, any cell, any virus, any fungus, any mold, any little critter that could cause us harm, all right? And in causing us harm, it might be that we stay alive, but we're forever feeding a tapeworm or roundworms, or it could be that the pathogen in doing us harm actually kills us. All right. And so our system, when we're born, as long as innately we have the right genetic makeup for all those cells, allows us a way to overcome all the variety of pathogens we might become exposed to throughout our life. So hopefully the pathogens don't cause us too much harm or kill us. Okay. All right. So going back to the first part of the system. Okay. The lymphatic part is ultimately I need to recover fluid and put it back in my cardiovascular system. I need to return the fluid so my plasma stays at the viscosity it needs to stay and the fluid filled with maybe some amino acids, some glucose, some urea, some bilirubin, some sodium, potassium, chloride ions are all going to go back into the plasma and then for the waste products, hopefully I can get rid of them next time they pass through the kidneys in a large uh, amount and then uh, other nutrients I can uh, maybe get them to the cells where they're most needed. All right. So when I look at the organs, the cells, the tissues, any place I see a large number of lymphocytes, that's going to be potentially a lymphatic tissue or an organ. All right. So the lymph fluid is going to be the fluid that is lost from the blood plasma to the extracellular area, the interstitial fluid. We can't let that fluid hang out that around cells because one, it'll become stagnant, it'll become warm, and it's a breeding site now filled with nutrients suspended in the waters uh, for bacteria and viruses and other pathogens. So I need that extracellular fluid to move so that way as fluid continues to leak out from the capillaries, some fluid is leaving the extracellular area making room for that new fluid. And as I move that excess fluid, I am going to 
pass it through these areas where I'm going to have large amounts of white blood cells, uh, lymphocytes, macrophages, dendritic cells in particular, and large populations of antibodies. So that way, if I have picked up a pathogen from a cut, from a break, from an entry point, I can hopefully uh, sequester, remove, and identify, and then find other critters of the same nature in my body before they can start to do me harm. Okay. Now, one of the big differences between a tissue versus an organ. When we think of organs, we usually think of something that's encapsulated in a connective tissue protective covering. So our lymphatic organs are going to have, like our spleen, our lymph nodes, they are going to have an entity that is a defining extracellular, or not extracellular, extra or a connective tissue structure and embedded inside. So think of like a tent that you're going to have walls to their tent um, and the, the, the poles are going to keep the walls from collapsing in. Okay. Um, our tissues, we're going to have a large number of cells, but they're going to be embedded and not necessarily as separated with a connective tissue capsule. So they might be embedded just within connective tissue that's already existence um, behind an epithelial lining. And our lymphoid tissue is our lymph node, uh, lymphoid tissues is going to be our, um, what do you call it, our tonsils, our uh, malts, and our Peyer's patches. Okay. All right. So when we look at the functions first, let's return fluid. And as we return fluid, let's do a very strenuous filtration of that fluid to remove any foreign, harmful, not necessary, or um, pathogenic type items. Okay. Now, there's no pump for the system. So this system is going to have to have a series of vessels that look very similar to veins. They are going to use many of the same mechanisms that veins do to generate small pressure gradients uh, so that way fluid will move from an area of high pressure to an area of low pressure. So they're going to have valves. They're going to use muscle pump and um, the surrounding uh, compression of clothing and tissue and whatever else to push on them. They're going to use the pressure gradients created by the thoracic cage with breathing to help, again, create small little areas that see high pressure as fluid accumulates versus areas where there's lower pressure and the fluid will then suction back towards the cardiovascular system at the subclavian veins. Okay. So the initial part of this system is the fluid is around your cells outside of capillaries and that fluid needs to slowly be accumulating in a secondary vessel system as more fluid is exiting out of the blood capillaries. So we're going to have these lymphatic capillaries which are more open-ended like finger-like open projections where the epithelial lining there is going to allow for not just fluid to pass through but potentially cells to pass through as well. So migrating immune cells, migrating lymphocytes, migrating um, neutrophils could potentially enter into these vessel finger-like capillaries. All right, and then eventually, again, as we collect fluid into a small segment, the pressure will build, and that will then allow fluid to move a little bit deeper into the vasculature to another area of low pressure, and then eventually they'll make it into a bigger vessel and then to a lymph node, okay? So, again, the main concept here is there's no like joining or touching of the lymphatic capillaries to the arteries. They're just free kind of open-ended areas near blood capillaries that are going to take some of that fluid that's leaking out, gather it up, and then slowly make its way back towards your cardiovascular system. The only place we're going to name lymphatic vessels anything super special is in the small intestines. The lymphatic capillaries and small vessels that are assisting in absorbing food nutrients like fat that have a harder time going in the plasma of water because plasma of water, it's moving fast, it needs to be small to better fit, um, is going to be the lacteals. And they are going to play a big role in helping us, again, absorb the fats from our diet and then eventually condensing them from a big fat molecule known as a chylomicron to a LDL, HDL, VLDL particle. Okay. All right. Um, capillaries, again, from that histology point of view, they are going to have a single layer of epithelial tissue. They are going to have a 
uh, merged lamina propriae with the background connective tissue that's also around the cells of that surrounding area. The space between some of the epithelial tissues is going to be pretty robust. So if, let's say, one of the cells, um, like let's say this cell right here decided, you know what, I want to leave this area, it is possible that that cell could push in and join the lymphatic area in addition to moving mobile lymphocytes, moving mobile macrophages, moving um, neutrophils or eosinophils. Okay. All right, so again, we're not going to see lymphatics in places where um, there's really no blood capillaries, all right? So we're not going to see lymphatic capillaries basically where we don't see blood capillaries. Okay, so this just again shows you a different little picture that the lymphatic capillaries start where the blood capillaries are. As the blood capillaries leak fluid, some of that fluid needs to enter, and again, they form a little bit of a high pressure area, and they move up a little bit high pressure area, continue to move up. Eventually, lymphatic capillaries turn into lymphatic veins, and then lymphatic veins are going to enter through a duct system to allow them to go back into the right and left subclavian veins. The fluid that's in here is going to be originally from blood capillaries, so it's mostly water. There will be ions in there, so if there was sodium in the extracellular fluid and plasma, there'll be sodium here. If there's some potassium in the extracellular fluid and plasma, there'll be potassium here. If there's chloride, there's chloride. If there's calcium, there's calcium. If there's bilirubin, there could be some bilirubin here. If there's urea, there'll be some urea. Uh, some small amino acids, maybe a little bit of glucose, maybe some enzymes like acetylcholinesterase that's near um, synapses of muscles. There might be some other hormones and other factors and proteins and antibodies in here. All right, so the interstitial fluid is going to look like the plasma fluid minus the big protein transport proteins, the albumin, and that mainly becomes back to they can't leave the uh, they can't leave the blood supply because the blood capillary endothelial simple squamous you know layering doesn't let them leave uh, and so that's part of the reason why they don't get the extracellular interstitial fluid but the interstitial fluid is going to be made up of blood plasma okay and so lymph is going to be basically blood plasma minus some of the big transport proteins minus the albumin. All right. Now, eventually your small lymphatic vessels turn into larger lymphatic vessels. And again, in our bodies at the 1G environment on Earth, uh, these lymphatic vessels that are located below the heart are going to have to make their way back to the eventual subclavian veins above the heart, they are going to have to do so by, again, creating vessels with compartments that allow, with the help of valves, um, areas to, you know, very smallly get a little bit higher pressure than the area above, and so fluid will be suctioned up. They'll also have to depend on some of the um, muscle, mu uh, muscle pump system that veins use to help, again, prevent backflow. And they're going to have to even maybe use the breathing system to some degree as well. Now, when we look at the fluid, the lymphatic fluids of our body, the interstitial fluid being returned to the cardiovascular system, it's not equal on the right and left sides of our body. Our left body left head, left shoulder, left arm, left chest, and your entire lower limbs below the diaphragm are all going to return through the thoracic duct into the left subclavian vein. So two-thirds of your fluids come back through the lymphatic system and end up on the left side, left subclavian vein. The right lymphatic duct is going to take fluid from the right arm, right shoulder, right chest, and right head. And that's known as the right lymphatic duct. And so a third of your fluid makes it way, its way back through the um, right lymphatic duct into the cardiovascular system. Right? When we look at, the again, the thoracic duct is going to be up here in this little region, okay, pushing into the left subclavian vein. The diaphragm is going to have this little bit of an enlargement here, and that enlargement is known as the cisterna chile. And just like what we do at veins, we're going to have a little bit of like a fluid collection here. And when we breathe and we let the 
thoracic cage increase so the lungs can get bigger, there's going to be less pressure in this thoracic area and that's going to pull these vessels open just a tad and that's going to create a little lower pressure by Boyle's law inside and so then this fluid with, the, with a little bit of pressure greater than what it is here with an inhale occurring is going to help suction up a, quite a huge push of fluid into these thoracic vessels which will then continue their way up and push back in through the thoracic duct. Okay, uh, so again, most of the system from the left side is, is, and the lower body is coming back through the thoracic duct. All right, so what happens if we don't get that fluid back? All right, so one of the big post-surgical complications for mastectomies is the lack or the removal of the lymphatic ducts, the lymphatic, not the lymphatic ducts, the lymphatic lymph nodes and some of the vasculature near the breast tissue, which then creates this way, a system where we have a hard time returning all that fluid to the um, subclavian veins. When we do not return the fluid efficiently, we will have fluid accumulate in the interstitial area and that fluid will eventually push on cells, push on the skin and press our skin and press our body out. And so this is again like an erection. We're going to have a lot of turgor pressure extending and dis and causing what's known as lymphodemia. All right? And the extension and the stretching of the skin is part of the problem, but the other part of the problem is remember that this fuel or this is um this fluid is warm. It's 98 degrees. This fluid comes from plasma. So there could be amino acids, carbon carbon molecules in there. There could be some fats. There could be some glucose. And so if a bacteria or a virus makes residence in this fluid, it's now sitting in a warm, moist, fuel-rich, carbon-carbon molecule environment that it can now propagate, grow, divide, and multiply. And so part of the lymphedema is, yes, going to cause damage to the integument and damage to uh, and problems maybe with cardiovascular system. But the other side of it is you're becoming a stagnant cesspool for bacterial and viral infections to be able to grow and propagate. All right. Another place that this happens, if you ever um, Google an, uh, elephant titus, there's a little fluke or worm or something that will get into the lymphatic areas and uh, block lymphatic tissues. And so uh, when that happens, again, the fluid can't continue to move up and go away, and so they can have lymphedema. And just when you do that search on the internet for elephant titus, just be aware it's gross. And sometimes they show you limbs that are so dis distended with lymph fluid uh, that they look the size of an elephant foot. And these people can't move because to try to lift their leg with that much water weight, it's impossible. And then if any cuts and sores happen, um, they just fester because, again, nothing is moving. So the bacteria or viruses that make their way in are going to literally just propagate and survive in that environment. Environment. All right. Um, so, what do we do about this? So, if for cancer treatment we remove the lymphatic vessels, we're going to put people in compression sleeves. We're going to try to not let the skin distend out and we're going to put them in a nice, tight compression. Uh, to again help the fluid push up back towards the vessels that are still intact and could still possibly take that fluid and connect it to the right lymphatic duct or thoracic duct. Uh, we're going to ask them to do physical therapy and actually do some physical movements and then hopefully doing that whatever again vessels they have intact can get some muscle pump push and move that fluid again back towards vessels that still connect to the um, to the ducts. And then with time hope that maybe some of the vasculature of the lymphatic system will go back. It might not be as perfect, but it might grow back enough to where the lymphedema isn't as um, resoundingly huge in the system. So mastectomies that go ahead and take lots of lymphatic nodules in and around the lymph tissue are one of the big places we see this happening outside of the parasite that does it in um, some of these really um, third world locations. Okay, so the summary of the system for the most part, uh, your major glands are your spleen. Your spleen has a hilus. Your spleen 
is different from all your other organs of the lymphatic system because it gets blood instead of lymph fluid. So the cells that live in the spleen, which are going to be in the white pulp areas, your T cells, your B cells, so the lymphocytes and some of your macrophages and neutrophils that live there are going to come into contact with blood directly. So they have the ability to find blood-borne pathogens that reside in the plasma of the blood as well as any pathogens associated with the red blood cells the platelets or old red blood cells and old platelets. All right. The other big gland that's unique to the lymphatic system is your thymus gland. Now your thymus gland is part of the lymphatic system because it's a large population of lymphocytes there. The fluid that's in here is not lymph fluid because it's not a fluid that is returning to the cardiovascular system. The thymus gland gets put on the list of lymphatic organs because it has a high population of lymphocytes. And to be specific, it's the site where cells becoming T cells are going to leave the bone marrow to go to in order to become the buzzword immunocompetent. Lymph nodes are going to be another part of the system. And again, lymph nodules are going to be high density in the armpit, in the uh, groin, around the vertebra, around the mesentery, in the neck. They're basically near these major entry exit points of the body and major kind of funnel points for massive amounts of fluid returning towards your um, thoracic and right lymphatic duct. They are going to have, again, a capsule. So just like the spleen and the thymus, there's a capsule. There's some connective tissue that defines it. Inside will be large populations, again, of different arrangements of lymphocytes and immune cells. And the purpose of these lymph nodes is as a few vessels come in, which are going to be known as afferent with the letter A, that bring lymph fluid into these nodules. They are going to come into contact with cells that can phagocytose them, so dendritic cells, macrophages. If that doesn't capture the pathogen or the proteins or the viral packet of materials, hopefully some antibodies being made by our activated plasma B cells will interact with those pathogens and identify them because we've already found them and activated antibodies to them. Well, if the pathogen hasn't been found yet and it's made it past antigen presenting cells and activated B cells and their antibodies, then hopefully our T helper cells and our naive B cells will recognize, come into contact with that pathogen and initiate a new specific defense. All right. It has uh, a pathogen potentially has to go through multiple lymphatic nodules. So the uh, goal or the idea that they would evade capture, evade finding out um, is pretty slim uh, because of the multitude of nodules that you have to pass. And then when you think about all the cells in those nodules, the multiple at antigen presenting cells that could phagocytose it, the number of antibodies they get passed and the number of naive cells they get passed that don't come into contact with it is pretty small occurrence, pretty small emphasis. Uh, lymphatic nodules are sometimes known with cancers to be our satellite areas to know if cancer tumors are beginning to try to migrate. So there's really no way for a cell to leave its original home location unless it takes a ride through the lymphatic system and then gets in the blood supply and gets out of the blood supply in a new location. So in many cases, part of the reason why we use lymphatic nodules to tell us if cancer is spreading is if a cell wants to try to move, its only means of tunneling out of its original location is through lymphatic vasculature. So it's big enough, like veins, this fluid moves slow enough, the access points into the capillaries have space for cells to enter as well as other larger items that end up in interstitial fluid. Our Pyres patches, our malts, our tonsils work um, at places where we know potential pathogens are going to get in. So the tonsils are in the back of your throat. They could end up being responding to nasal pathogens or um, mouth orthopathogens that come in with food, water, and air. So we put these large populations of lymphatic cells behind your epithelial lining in the nasal and mouth areas and the pharynx because those are going to be areas where if we ingest something, drink something, or breathe something that has living viral and D and bacterial and fungus and mold populations in it, we want to be able to capture it right away before it can get closer to the blood supply.
Pyres, patches, aggregated lymph nodes, and malts are going to be right there behind uh, epithelial tissue of the small intestines. And again, they're going to be close to an area that I know that I'm going to do a lot of absorption of nutrients. And so if a pathogen exists, it is a potential way for them to get past epithelial cells. But if these large populations of T cells and B cells and macrophages exist, the goal would be that I would capture that pathogen before it has an ability to get into my bloodstream and then wreak havoc somewhere else. And when you think about how good our system is, I mean, if you just go touch a doorknob and then touch your face, you know, 90% of the time we don't get sick from doing that. Uh, most of the time, if we probably really tested our food, I'm sure there's some pathogens in there. And yet very rarely do we actually get mm, food poisoning or, you know, throwing up sickness afterwards. So we have really great ability to, if something is contaminated with the pathogen, we truly try to capture it, remove it, and keep it from causing us harm pretty early in the system. And that's what our um, tissues give us that availability behind the barriers that our epithelial lining provides. However, if it does get past um, most of these areas and ends up in an interstitial area in an extracellular space between cells. The goal would be then our lymph nodes and moving lymphatic fluid, interstitial fluid into those lymph nodes multiple times before we let it go into the bloodstream will hopefully be another capacity of being able to capture pathogens. Okay, so that's kind of the anatomy that's the gist of most of the lymphatic cells, organs, and your um, vessels. Okay and your lymph fluid. So moving on to a little bit more on the cells, uh, there's still from our book a lot that is probably wrong, a lot that is still unknown, a lot that is still confusing. So we're going to try to just hit the cliff notes, all right? Lymphatic tissues mean there's lymphatic cells located. Now T cells and B cells are the two main cells we worry about, but there could also be other cells there to include natural killer cells, macrophages, eosinophils, neutrophils, which together collectively are known as microphages, and then your basophils slash mast cells. Again, your tissues are just going to be larger areas of these cells embedded in the already background connective tissue, and your organs, you have a defined space that is surrounded by a connective tissue capsule. Okay. All right, lymphocytes, again, from chapter 19, these are cells that come from hematocytoblasts, so that hemostomat, hem, oh, I can't talk, the cell in your red bone marrow that gives rise to all of your blood cells. In making lymphocytes, I don't want colony stimulating factor. I don't want to push the daughter cell to become a myeloid progenitor cell. Instead, I want that cell to become a lymphoid progenitor cell. Once I get it to go into the lymphoid progenitor cell route, if that cell gets pushed to the thymus gland, it's going to eventually become a T cell, thus it's a thymus gland developed lymphocyte. If it stays in the bone marrow, and these were initially the two categories of these cells, we would call it a B cell because now it's a bone marrow developed lymphocyte. But what we learned with some time and with better genetic techniques is that there's another population of cells that stays in the bone marrow, but they are killing cells. So they act like cytotoxic T cells in that they have the ability to recognize something as being invaded by a virus, by being cancerous, by not acting appropriate, by being a self cell, but a hijack self cell and they can kill it. So we decided or somebody decided that they were going to be known as the natural killer cells. So natural killer cells have an ability to kill cells, but they have this ability to kill cells, recognize cells that need to be killed without having lived in the thymus gland, and they developed and matured in the bone marrow with the B cells. And that's kind of a a concept that we skipped in chapter 19 that now shows up in chapter 22. Okay. All right. T cells. I need you to know that we have these categories of T cells. We have killer T cells, also known as cytotoxic T cells. These are cells that interact with other cells that have somehow been hijacked by a virus. So they're best at virus cells. 
have been taken over by maybe another type of parasite or fold or monkey, mon uh, fungus, have become maybe cancerous, and we make those cells die. All right, suppressor cells are to try to keep killer and cytotoxic T cells from going overboard and starting to attack and kill cells that are not maybe infected or going rogue. Uh, memory cells supposedly are going to keep these uh, the memory of the antigen that a cell could potentially be expressing that would recognize it as being a virus producing cell or a cell that's um, been going been damaged in some way and no longer acting appropriate. And your helper T cells are a population of cells that are the usually they're the CD8, CD4 expressing cells according to our book, which work with recognizing the immunocompetence component of when to turn on cytotoxic T cells and cell mediated immunity and when to turn on B cells and B cell mediated immunity. Okay. All right, so know the big categories of what most of the T cells could potentially be categorized. B cells are usually going to be naive cells when they are told or introduced to a pathogen, potentially by a T helper cell, they will start to recreate their genes to make proteins that now have a piece on them that recognizes a specific antigen. Now they can become activated and turn into plasma cells and start making and turning out lots of antibodies towards this antigen. And the antibodies travel easier than B cells because they're smaller, they're proteins, and they can travel in water. The, the making of all these antibodies is part of the specific defenses known as the humoral immunity side, all right? Because they go through the humors of the body, the blood, the lymph, the fluid, everywhere. Natural killer cells are going to be able to kill cells without potentially having to be told by a T cell. And so that's why they fall under our nonspecific defense mechanisms and immu immunological surveillance because they can tell if a cell not necessarily is a virus or bacteria cell that's gone rogue and taken over, but they're more of like being able to tell if, uh, um, if cells have turned cancerous. Okay, but they can do all the other things too. All right, so the main point of this is to tell you that lymphocytes are the second most numerous cells in the blood. Um, they're distributed in odd kind of ways, and they can last a really long time. And it's important that they can because they are the reason why we don't have to maybe get vaccinated and booster shots constantly. Um, because as long as we have those memory cells that retain the ability to regen, uh, regenerate a lot of antibodies against a certain pathogen, we don't need to get boosters or vaccinated over and over again. Unfortunately, with flu, it changes so much that we have to. Where do all the lymphocytes come from? In red bone marrow, hemocytoblasts are the stem cells. They usually divide and either become a myeloid cell or a lymphoid cell. If they start down the lymphoid pathway, they can, under the influence of certain factors, become what will be a T cell, head to the thymus gland, get exposed to thymolytic hormones, and mature into T helper cells, cytotoxic T cells, suppressor cells, etc. If the cell stays in the bone marrow, and one of the ways it can be told to turn into a B cell would be to have exposure to the cytokine interleukin-7, that is how we end up making naive B cells that with activation and introduction to an antigen will turn into plasma cells and memory cells. And now we know that some of our killing cells have this ability to kill without having gone to the thymus gland. They have some immunocompetence capability. They play a role in nonspecific immunological surveillance, and those are the natural killer cells. Okay. Um, just to kind of go through again, B cells stay in the bone marrow. When they get to a point at which they're ready to be um, activated and turned into plasma cells upon contact with an antigen, they can leave the bone marrow. All right, so again, stem cell production. How does the hemocytoblast know when to become something that becomes a lymphocyte and then a T cell, a B cell, or a natural killer cell? It all comes back to those cytokines. It all comes back to when a cell is in distress or when damage occurs, part of what's being released at the injury site to help clean up and kill debris and kill pathogens are these chemical molecules that bring more white blood cells to the area, change blood flow, and then some of them hit a, hit a ride in the bloodstream and end up in the bone marrow to tell hematopoietic stem cells to up 
up the rate of making B cells, up the rate of making T cells, up the rate of making natural killer cells. Okay. Um, lymphoidal tissue. So our tonsils, we are going to learn that they are large populations of cells and because they are constantly potentially introducing or being exposed to airborne, waterborne, or foodborne pathogens, they're going to have lots of germinating or mitosis rich areas where naive B cells are becoming plasma cells and memory cells. T cells are activating and becoming cytotoxic T cells and other T helper cells and functional cells and they are going to be these large areas of these lymphocytes behind epithelial lining and glucose um, and globlet cells, mucus cells, you know, that make a sticky substance to capture some of these pathogens so they don't make it all the way down to our lungs or our stomach. All right? We have three pairs of tonsils. We have the pharyngeal tonsils, sometimes they're known as the adenoid. We have the palatine tonsils, and we have the lingual tonsils. Normally, when we think of the back of our throat and going, ah, we're thinking about the palatine and the lingual. The adenoids are up there by our eustachian tube, and in some cases, when kids get tubes put in or tubes removed, they sometimes get their adenoids removed with them. For our aggravated lymph nodes, again, uh, they're going to be in the same category in the malts as kind of these uh, tonsils in that there's no slight capsule. There's no capsular uh, border. There's nothing that kind of encloses all of these lymphatic areas. So that's why these are considered tissues and not necessarily organs. Okay. For our aggravated lymph nodes, Peyer's patches, again, it's a large population of white blood cells kind of embedded in connective tissue behind epithelial lining where we know food is coming in. Um, malts, again, are going to be, again, right behind a mucus-rich area that's going to have lots of potentially growing mitosing white blood cell populations to make more antibodies, to make more cytotoxic T cells, to make more uh, cytokines that then can communicate and keep, you know, the immune system function of capturing pathogens going. These uh, vessels that come into this area will still, again, take fluid from there, and like other lacteal vessels, will eventually make their way to lymph nodes that will then further ensure the filtration and removal of pathogens that might have gotten past these malts or aggregated lymph nodes. Uh, the organs have this capsule, and again, our lymph nodes are our most numerous lymph organ. It sees that fluid come in through afferent vessels. Afferent vessels are afferent to this lymph node. Efferent vessels, along with the blood supply coming in and out from your small artery and vein, are going to form a hilum, and it's going to be an efferent vessel in relation to this lymph node, but it could very well turn into an afferent vessel for the next lymph node. The subscapular space, the areas of arranging where the cells are in the cortex, the outer third versus the medulla, the inner third of the organ, is going to be based upon, again, these trabecular kind of like pole formations, two by four formations that are there kind of keeping the lymph node inflated in some way so fluid can pass through and increase the likelihood that the fluid interacts with uh, macrophages, dendritic cells, antigen presenting cells that can then if they capture anything bring it to T cells or increase the likelihood that lots of antibodies are available for the fluid to again interact with so if an antibody meets its antigen it can find it, highlight it and help remove it. There are going to be some naive cells towards the medulla, and again, those naive cell regions play a role, and if it's a new pathogen that we've not seen before, hopefully we quickly are able to generate a new specific immune defense and cytotoxic cell activation and B cell activation that gets cell-mediated and humoral-mediated immunity going quickly. Again, the locations of where most of the lymph nodes are located are in big kind of funneling areas before we get back to the cardiovascular system. Normally, they are going to be the indicators if I have for the cervical, so in my neck, if I have an air, food, or um, or water liquid borne pathogen that tried to get in through the mouth or the nose. The axillary will be a good area if something's going on in the breast or in the arm because most of the fluid coming back is going to come back through the lymph nodes there. The inguineal is going to again tell me about anything cuts abrasions in my lower limbs like my legs because uh, that's the groin. Uh, 
uh, or the testicles could come into play there. Uh, the vertebral column, again, most of the back of the body, and the mesenteric, anything that's gotten past the epithelial lining, the Peyer's patches, and the malts, and is now trying to get to the bloodstream and take up residence that was foodborne and has gotten past most of the digestive tract and gotten into the body. Again, for the lymphatic organs, if you just read the book, it tells you that when fluid comes in, the first set of cells it tends to come into contact with are antigen-presenting cells, cells that can phagocytose, remove the pathogen from the fluid, and capture it, start breaking it down internally, put some of that pathogen on its MHC2, and present it to a T cell. If it does get past the macrophages and the dendritic cells, we would love to get close to plasma B cells outputting lots of antibodies for known antigens. And the hope would be that the pathogen has already been identified and we already have antibodies to it and those antibodies find it, start to interact with it, red flag it, and then with the help of complement, punching holes in it, neutrophils and macrophages coming over and eating it, we get removal of that pathogen into small pieces and parts. If we go into the medulla portion, again, we're going to see that's where the T cells that potentially are going to get the antigen presenting, you know, cells to come to them and interact. That's where we're going to have naive B cells. That's where we're going to have naive T cells that can gin up a new specific defense cytotoxic or cell mediated pathway and plasma cell pathway. Okay. Uh, lymph nodes, again, they are great at what they do because the fluid that exits the blood by the time it gets back to the blood is 99% pure if a pathogen had gotten in. All right, so they are really good at keeping pathogens that have broken through a cut in your skin or your mouth or throat area or the anus or with your food. They are really good at keeping those pathogens from getting into the bloodstream where then they have more free reign to travel to other areas of the body. And again, the early warning system, if something is trying to get in, you're usually going to see the lymph nodes closest to where that entry point was light up or have the... Um, capacity to enlarge, swell, and initiate immune responses over the lymph nodes further away. So like when you have a sore throat, the lymph nodes in your neck swell up, not the lymph nodes in your groin. They're, the lymph nodes in your groin are not nearest to that um, pathogen, so I know that my pathogen is most likely a throat food or air or water pathogen because it came in and my warning system is telling me with cervical lymph node um, edema, pain, discomfort, and inflammation. All right, the thymus gland, like I said, is where the T cells go to become immunocompetent. Um, in children, the thymus gland will kind of grow with them, but as we get to adult and we look at the mediastinum, it's a very small area that's still this defined thymus gland. Uh, there's a lot of information that's out on this because we know now that natural killer cells don't go to the thymus gland, so they are somehow immunocompetent without having been exposed to thymolytic hormones. So there's more to immunocompetency than just having cells visit the thymus gland and maturing like T cells do. The spleen, again, is our most unique lymphatic organ in that there's no lymphatic vessels bringing just lymphatic fluid in. I'm bringing blood and so it gives me an opportunity and to some extent the liver does this too to remove old red blood cells, platelets, albumin, some of the other um, big binding proteins, remove them from circulation because they are not able to leave the blood supply and maybe get into lymphatic fluids and then lymphatic vessels and tissues. Okay. Uh, in the areas of the spleen where there's a high hemoglobin content, there will be red blood cells because that's where the hemoglobin's coming from. That's the red pulp. In areas where there's not a lot of red blood cells and cells might be going through active transcription, translation, active mitosis, that's the white pulp areas. And those represent where your macrophages and your lymphocytes typically live and stay as the blood passes through and interacts with those white pulp areas. So those are all the organs, tissue, cells of the lymphatic system. Um, again, it's you need to know everything that's kind of listed on this picture, that two-thirds of the fluid's coming back through thoracic, one-third through right lymphatic. The fluid comes from plasma. It looks like plasma, except it doesn't have the big items 
um, and some of the big binding proteins in albumin. Uh, the goal of keeping plasma at the right viscosity, the blood at the right viscosity, is that this fluid gets back. The goal is that the fluid doesn't sit and become a cesspool for bacteria and viruses that get in near that area, can live in and propagate unchecked. So lymphatic vessels exist much like veins with the same difficulties as veins of no pump, low pressure, and has to get the fluid back to the sub clavian veins. So like veins, the vessels are big, they have valves, they have muscle pump use and compression on the skin that has to help push the fluid up to the next compartment, and they use breathing with the cisterna uh, chile to get most of that lower body fluid into the thoracic cage and up to the thoracic duct. For the immunity, we usually are dividing it into two broad categories. First off, your immunity comes from just being a human. There are some pathogens out there that are not going to attack humans because they are geared towards attacking a different host. So in the event that your human DNA is corrupted, wrong, that could increase the risk that you don't have the innate defense against those human-only pathogens. And again, the innate defense also is that if I have normal human DNA in my cells, then I have all the potential mechanisms in those cells should I need them to amp up defenses that fall on the adaptive side. So if you were to somehow have defective T helper cells, you would have potentially defective innate immunity, and that defective innate immunity would prevent you from having any then acquired immunity because you don't have working normal T helper cells. For the acquired side, again, that comes from even at birth, you are now going to constantly for the rest of your life be bombarded by different stimuli and factors and pathogens. And our ability to not succumb to every single pathogen is part of how acquired immunity works and exists. So for the seven nonspecific defenses, you need to know these seven and you need to know in the big picture of how they work. So most of the physical barriers are defenses that come from epithelial linings of other organ systems, right? So the mucous membranes that exist producing mucus that can trap particles in the air, in the water, trap particles in food so they don't actually get into your system as deep and maybe you can cough or throw this, the mucus up or prevent it from getting into the cells and then into the tissues. All right, stomach lining has acid and then the stomach lining itself has more additional epithelial tissue that prevents things from getting in. Uh, your skin and your sebum is your largest organ protecting everything underlying, so it needs to be impenetrable for the most part to most pathogens. And when it is penetrable, you need backup mechanisms behind it. Uh, an entry point is the vagina, and it's sometimes we want things to come in, but most of the time we still don't want the bacteria and pathogens to live in their warm, moist environment, so we make mucus and other things to uh, make it inhospitable at times. All right, so behind every epithelial lining is usually macrophages, neutrophils, eosinophils, and mast cells. And the reason why they're there is pathogens get crafty. They get better at defending themselves and getting past defenses. So if they get past defenses of the epithelial cells touching each other, the epithelial mucus layer, the epithelial oil layer, the goal would be that hopefully they get past that epithelial system and immediately come into contact with the cell that's capable of eating it, ingesting it through endocytosis. Because these cells are in the immune system, we go one step further and say ingest them due to phagocytosis. Uh, macrophages are usually the big cell that we think of that can ingest an entire entity. So they could potentially ingest the entire bacterium, the entire single-celled amoeba. Neutrophils and eosinophils, being microphages, are going to tend to have to release their vesicle contents, which will help them break cells, break pathogens into smaller pieces and parts. And then those smaller pieces and parts will be ingested by multiple neutrophil and eosinophil cells. All of these cells tend to take that, what they take in, destroy it, and take a little piece of it to present on their MHC class 2 that then allows that antigen from that device that was ingested to be assessed for self, not self criteria, and to potentially initiate cell-mediated immunity and 
antibody mediated immunity through the specific immune defenses, defenses with T helper cell involvement. The natural killer cells are our third part of the nonspecific defenses. Like cytotoxic T cells, they have an ability to kill cells. They are going to do it by interacting with those cells. They are going to recognize if the cell is producing viral proteins, so not acting like it should. If the cell maybe has some other damage or issue going on that needs it to go through apoptosis or cell death. Uh, if the cell is potentially a tumor cell and starting to make inappropriate proteins, or if there's other some other parasite infection or takeover by a different mechanism. The way the natural killer cells work is when they run into a cell that's identified that needs to get re removed, they are going to make and release these proteins known as perforins. And what perforins do is they make a pore in the membrane of the cell that is being targeted for death. And by making a big hole in that membrane, they allow the materials of the cell to leak out and eventually enough of those holes and enough of the cell stuff leaking out makes the cell lice break apart and burst. How does the perforins not bind to the natural killer cell where the natural killer cell is going to make a kind of a silencing or a canceling feature by making a different protein known as protectins and protectins are going to be able to keep perforins from attaching and blowing holes up in the natural killer cell. Okay, so that is a big play in our cancer and our virus-mediated defenses um, or virus and parasite-mediated defenses where we're active against an infection that's ongoing or occurring. The next category of nonspecific defenses is about some of the cytokines. So the cytokines are going to be, again, these molecules that communicate between cells, specifically can bring in immune cells to a distressed cell, be a way that the cells can communicate to the bone marrow to increase or ramp up numbers of immune cells. And one of the groups that is known to interfere with how viruses work in cells is the group of proteins known as interferons. So again, we learned a lot of this in the HIV time frame. Interferons are going to be made by cells that have an ability to recognize that a virus is in their membrane within their membrane in their cytoplasm and is working towards influencing the cells activity by injecting its um, DNA or RNA into that cells now DNA and hopefully the cell is still able with transcription and translation to make these signaling interferon proteins release them to the cells around them and that is how these cells then get the message if they are also infected to ramp up their defenses if they're not infected to ramp up their defenses uh, to pull over lymphocytes neutrophils and macrophage because the cell is kind of saying I need to die, I'm infected. And so it's signing its death warrant by bringing those cells over, which should then be able to bind to the MHC class 1 receptor, see that the cell is making viral proteins and is acting inappropriate, and kill it. All right? And so some of your lymphocytes, some of your T cells, some of your macrophages know to go to injury sites because of interferons, because that's how they know that a cell is in need of assistance from the immune system. Complements another set of proteins that again fall under the cytokine kind of blanket. They are going to be more of a role in bacterial breakdown and, and um, protection. They are going to have, again, the main way they work is working with antibodies. So we've made antibodies that can find foreign antigens and what the antibodies do when they find foreign antigens is they bind to it and they kind of make it a bigger target so macrophages and neutrophils in the area could potentially see it, eat it, cytotoxic and natural killer cells could see it, eat it and remove it. Okay. Um, what happens with complement is in the classical pathway, we've identified that there's this protein known as C1, the complement 1 protein, that has binding sites on the part of the antibody that never changes. And by binding to that antibody, it allows now another few proteins to get pulled in the C3 protein to become an activated enzyme, so we take off its protective covering, allowing it to then take these other complement proteins and form a hole in the membrane of the bacterium. 
once we form a hole in that cell, things are going to fly out that are wanting to equalize with the interstitial fluid, and we, that bacterium is going to lice, or it's going to blow up or break into fragments, and we are going to need to clean it up. All right? So complement is very good at helping us, again, once we know something is not self and an antibody is binding to it, it's one of the ways we can get it to die. We still potentially need macrophages and neutrophils to come clean up the debris, but this at least helps us, along with whatever else neutrophils kick out, um, break apart a potential pathogen that would have been too big for neutrophils and eosinophils to eat. However, there's another pathway where complement can work, and this way is slower. It's called the alternate pathway, and the reason why it's not as efficient, not as effective and slower is complement works without that help of the antibody confirming that the pathogen or the cell that they're about to form a, a molecule and a pore for is actually a pathogen. So this is the less preferred way for complement to work. Um, it starts differently because there's no antibody bound to this, the pathogen. Uh, if the certain proteins known as propretin, factor D, factor B come together, that is potentially another way to know if something is not self. And so other complement proteins, again, are going to get activated, C3 becomes C3B, and then forms a pore, punches, a, punches into that bacterium, causing it to lyse, just like the classical pathway. It's just we started with a different mechanism that didn't involve the antibodies. Okay. Again, the end result is complement works with antibodies, so it's a little more efficient at knowing that that's a foreign object because there's an antibody to it. It can also help remove potentially cells that aren't antibodies made to it, but that's a little scarier because it could potentially turn on cells that are healthy and normal and shouldn't be killed, and it's inappropriately thinking they should. All right, so more to come on complement as you get into your higher level biology and immunology classes. The second to last thing we got to talk about for nonspecific defenses is inflammation. And when I talk about inflammation, I'm talking about, let's go back to clotting. You know, one of the things that happens when cells e explode is potassium ends up from the inside of the cell outside the cell membrane. Adenosine ends up from in the cell outside the cell membrane. Proteins that should be always in a cell, DNA, RNA, they should all be inside the cell. They're now outside the cell in the interstitial fluid. All of those solutes are going to change the osmosis gradient, causing that extracellular area to have more solutes than normal and water is going to get pulled in. We're going to see that healthy intact vessels are going to buy these and damaging molecules being exposed to it are going to trigger uh, constriction of damaged vessels and non-damaged vessels might dilate to help bring in more neutrophils and other white blood cells to this area. More cells to the area, again more leakage, more uh, dilated arterioles to intact capillaries in and near the area, more fluid. So that's part of the reason why inflammation is going to have swelling, going to have increased cell number, increased pressure, and that is also going to be why it could be painful. There's going to be increased metabolism of the cells in this area, trying to clean up the debris, trying to generate new cell growth to try to fix the already damaged area. And so that's going to be part of the reason why there's going to be more heat. All right, so inflammation can happen at a very local level, like just at the injury site. Sometimes, depending upon if the pathogens that have gotten in have spread or the area is kind of large, it can be an entire joint area or an entire um, limb, you know, maybe. Uh, and then if it really is a whole body infiltration and pathogen winning the battle for a little while over the immune system, it could be a whole body inflammatory response. One of the things we do with like people that have inflammation in their joints and the pain for the joint is give them cortisol, give them steroids. Um, again, we're trying to knock down the immune system and the changes that occur with fluid, osmosis, pain management, because we're stopping the release of the chemicals and the cell damage um, to the interstitial fluid. 
the again inflammation part of what's going on with some of the reasons why the solutes are there in higher amounts is some of those solutes are growth factors they're going to help regrow vessels they're going so they're vegf they're growth factors they're uh, endothelial growth factors fibroblast growth factors they're going to push the connective tissue to to fix itself the epithelial lining to fix itself and so there's a lot of growth factors in here that play a role in one being an, a solute so it pulls in more fluid pulls in more um, cells but then by pulling in those cells in that environment we potentially are getting more healing eventually damaged materials moved out and new materials laid down all right so again cytokines are going to be many of the flu the fluid drawing solutes and some of those cytokines are there to play a role in being growth factors play a role in altering fluid balance playing a role in arterial constriction dilation play a role in pushing cells to go through mitosis go through um, different mechanisms physiologically using energy and fuel expenditure and so that is part of what is massively why we have a large blanket category for proteins involved in communicating between cells, especially immune cells known as cytokines. Fever is our last nonspecific defense for today. It is again initiated that our body temperature needs to rise to enhance cell metabolism, meaning chemical reactions. If I make chemical reactions work in a little warmer environment, they work a little faster, therefore enhancing maybe the immune cell's ability to overcome and kill pathogens that have gotten into the system. How does the body know to increase the set point in the hypothalamus? Cytokines. So, Interleukin-7 was a cytokine that told uh, a lymphatic progenitor cell to become a B cell. Another one, interleukin-1, goes to the hypothalamus, interacts with some of the uh, neurons in the hypothalamus to tell them to raise body temperature, and that happens, and we get a fever because now we want to be at 101 degrees, 102 degrees for our resting basal temperature, and, uh, and that maybe triggers temperature receptors to be painful in joints, giving us pain in joints in problems. But the end result is fever is good because it helps elevate cells' ability and chemical reactions' ability to run faster. It sucks because it hurts. So that's part of the reason why people usually when they have fevers want to take um, Tylenol because they don't want to hurt with the temperature receptors in our joints and, and everything like that. But sometimes if you can tolerate it, you should keep the fever. So at this point, we've gone through most of the introductory information on Chapter 22, and we've gone through the seven key parts of nonspecific defenses. Getting into the specific defenses is about getting into how the T cells work and how do we get antibodies made, how do we up the number of free-floating antibodies, plasma cells, memory cells, how do we get cell-mediated responses, cytotoxic T cells activated, and killing cells expressing viral proteins. And that really, it's a little confusing, um, but I'll get to that in a different video because I've gone my 45 minutes that I promised this video would be. So I'm going to stop here. Um, this should get us to about uh, page 805 in the purple book. That is the end of nonspecific defenses. So 22.4 is now where we need to finish up and hopefully finish this chapter quickly in another video that I will redo hopefully maybe tomorrow, Friday, or this weekend. If you have questions, of course, you use uh, bring them up in lab when we meet. And of course, uh, you can always email me and use your group um, communication websites to ask your classmates. All right, have a good night.